and encouraged us in our work. He is known as one of the most renowned Orthodox Christian theologians of our time. May his memory be eternal. I would like to now introduce our moderator, Dr. Carrie Frederick Frost. Carrie is secretary of the St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess. She is a lecturer at Western Washington University, an adjunct professor at St. Sophia Ukrainian Orthodox Seminary, and author of the forthcoming publication titled Church of Our Granddaughters, which looks at issues of women in the Orthodox Church, including the ordination of deaconesses. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Anne Marie. And I would like to welcome all my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here with us today. The purpose of this evening is to consider why and how deaconesses are needed in the Orthodox Church today. In a few minutes, our esteemed panelists will share their thoughts on this issue of need, and we'll also have ample time for thoughts and questions from our participants. We decided as a board of St. Phoebe Center to host this webinar because this is a question we get asked, what is the need for deaconesses? Why are deaconesses needed in the Orthodox Church? Why are they needed today? So this is our effort to begin to answer that question. So a few bits of housekeeping. You've noticed that this meeting is being recorded. The first part of it will be recorded, but then we'll stop recording before we get to the open discussion and Q&A. Please um, stay muted if you are not speaking. And I think that we have uh, you know, arranged a benevolent dictatorship to make sure that's the case. Um, but when you are called upon as a panelist or someone who's offering a thought, you will need to unmute. You'll get an unmute message. Um, so first I will introduce our panelists. And then each of them will offer about 12 minutes of their thoughts on this issue of need of deaconesses today. Then we'll have a little bit of discussion among panelists. And then we will open up to questions and comments from the participants, which we are eager to hear. During the event, if you have questions or comments you want to post in the chat, you're welcome to do so. And then we'll acknowledge some of those when we get to the end. Also, there will be an opportunity to unmute and to speak during the discussion part of the evening. Now, I'm sorry to note that one of our scheduled panelists is not able to be with us. This is Nicholas Denisinko, and he sends his regrets, but is having some health problems. Please keep him in your prayers. I want to really quickly, before I introduce our first panelist for the evening, to acknowledge the other St. Phoebe <clears throat> board members, um, Sarah Sugranis, Susan Smoley, Helen Theodoropoulos, and our first speaker, Christina Bachtis. Christina is a licensed art therapist and a credentialed art therapy supervisor. She co-founded the Handmaiden Ministry at the OCA Cathedral of the Holy Virgin Protection in New York City, and as we've said, serves on the board of the St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess Thank you for being with us, Christina, for being willing to share your thoughts. And I'm gonna go ahead and nominate you for best dressed of the evening. Would you be willing to show us the t-shirt that you have on? Fantastic. Many of us will recognize these names of famous and beloved deaconess saints in the church. Okay, Christina, go ahead and share us your thoughts and I will, if needed, give you a one minute warning. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about myself, who I am, and also touch upon what the Handmaiden Ministry is that Carrie talked about. Um, so I've grown up in the Orthodox Church. Um, my father is a priest in the OCA and a retired army chaplain. And growing up, I've had many opportunities to participate in services. Um, as being a priest kid and in a family of one car, um, when the priest has to be at church an hour early, the whole family has to be at church an hour early. So um, in the military chapel, we would set up the entire chapel, the iconostas, the books, the candle stands, take that all down at the end of the service. I was also encouraged by both my parents to sing, to serve during the service, and to read prayers and the epistle. So I believe that I'm still active in the life of the church because I was given opportunities to be of service as a child. So 
when attending the Cathedral of the Holy Virgin Protection in New York City. Uh, my friend Juliana and I noticed that the girls weren't serving and we wanted to give them an opportunity to serve in the way we did as, a as children. So we co-founded the Handmaiden Ministry so that girls could participate in the service, holding candles for the various um, entrances and blessing, bringing the, the Antietam on to be blessed. Currently, I'm attending Mother of God, Joy of All Who Sorrow in Princeton, New Jersey. And there I supervise all the children of all genders to serve during the service and really get involved in their church jobs. So when thinking about why we need deaconesses in the church today, I feel that it's a matter of sustainability and growth of the Orthodox Church. So let's go back to chapter six in Acts of the Apostles, which describes the formation of the diaconate to support the needs of a growing church. The apostles knew that they couldn't effectively carry out the ministry of the word and the ministry of serving the widows. It wasn't sustainable. So they created the diaconate. The result of having distinct ministries in the church is reported in chapter seven. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So where are we now as a church? There was a recent report called the US Religion Census 2020, Dramatic Changes in the American Orthodox Churches, which looked at the Orthodox churches in America across all jurisdictions from 2010 to 2020. And I'll put a link to the, the census in the chat a little later on. So between 2010 and 2020, the number of Orthodox Christians in America has declined by 17%. Um, this is included in this number is a 67% growth amongst the Oriental Orthodox churches, but amongst the Greek Orthodox Church, there was a 22% decline in membership. The OCA had a 12% decline. The Antiochians had a 5% decline in membership. We also hear often that there is a priest shortage, that there's lack of candidates to become bishops. And I wanna take a look at the roles in ministry also within our church. So the role of the priest. The priest celebrates the divine services, both regular Sunday services, vespers, feast day services, preaches, hears confessions, conducts baptisms, funerals, weddings, hospital visits, brings communion to homebound parishioners, blesses homes and businesses, provides marriage counseling and individual spiritual counseling, fundraising, building maintenance, plans community events, contributes to the church newsletter, runs retreats, oversees church school, teaches in choirs classes, adult education classes, works with the choir director on music for services, evangelizes in the community, live stream services, collaborates with local community organizations for charitable works, provides outreach and support to college students, and takes care of their own family. So just pausing right there, the apostles thought it was too much for them to do the ministry of the word, preaching the gospel, uh, teaching others, and serve widows. And this is what we're asking of our priests today in America. Also, in small parishes and in mission parishes, priests and matushkas are um, sometimes have to take on full-time jobs outside of the parish because they the parish can't afford to pay them a living wage. So in addition to all of this, they're also working. What's happened to the role of the, de of the deacon? So this has largely been reduced to a stepping stone to the priesthood. So a priest in training and to liturgical functionaries. So we see our deacons in the services, reciting petitions, reading the gospel, distributing communion, and that might be all. Then there's also lay leadership and lay ministries. Now, these are good because they offer opportunities for Orthodox Christians to use their talents to serve the church. However, these are volunteer positions and they're often the first to be let go when times are tough. So when you are experiencing a global pandemic and you don't know if you're going to maintain employment or 
you're working from home while also monitoring your children who are going to school from home and you're worried about getting sick, the last thing that you're thinking about is, oh, let me run church school or let me uh, serve in the, the choir or serve the church in some other way. That's one of the first things to go. It's also sometimes hard to fill these positions because people don't wanna be stuck in them forever. We do have this, this kind of tradition in the Orthodox Church where once you get a job, that's your job for life. So in, uh, in my parish in New York, there was someone who was running the candle stand until he died. And then my friend filled in until he moved and then somebody else took over. So people don't wanna get stuck in volunteer positions. There's also a lack of training a lack of resources and a lack of support to carry out these ministries. And types of opportunity change from parish to parish. So while that provides some creativity in terms of each parish to minister to their community in the way that it needs, it also means that if you are serving as a handmaiden, in a church in New York City, you might not necessarily you might not be able to do that in a church in another part of the diocese or in another state. So, how do we address clergy burnout, lack of laity involvement, and decline in membership? Luckily, we don't need to invent a ministry to serve and support our communities. We just need to fully utilize the ministry that already exists, the diaconate. So what would it mean to have a revitalized diaconate that includes men and women? It would mean that the church supports and affirms that both men and women are called to serve Christ through diaconal ministry. And this is important because that means that if you're a deacon in one church, you can be serve as a deacon in the other church. And your ministry is respected in all aspects wherever you travel. It also means that deacons and deaconesses would have the proper education and training to carry out their ministry, and that they are given the grace of the Holy Spirit to carry out this ministry through ordination. It's really important to have, to have the help of the Holy Spirit to carry this out. It also means that deacons and deaconesses will be performing acts of service on behalf of the church. So as a ordained deacon or deaconess, you're not just working on your own behalf as a Christian, you're representing the church in your ministry. So that means that the outreach of the church can spread. So for instance, if I was a deaconess, I'm not just serving my community as Christina because I'm a Christian and I'm called to through Christ. I am now a representative of the Orthodox church serving you. Right? That would expand our, our evangelization. Deacons and deaconesses can also support the priest and therefore the larger community by making hospital visits where they can anoint the sick and distribute communion, visiting homebound, leading inquiry classes and adult education classes, collaborating with the community for charitable works, supporting college students, leading reader service if the priest is, is sick or unavailable to be in the parish and assist in the divine services. Deacons and deaconesses can support lay leaders by providing education and guidance and help laity get involved in roles that match their talents. So I think a good example of this is at the cathedral in New York City. While the choir director and the choir were rehearsing, the deacon was teaching me how to read uh, the service of Vespers and why I'm saying this prayer at this time and helping me learn the service in that way. So this collaboration between the two, the two ministries of the ordained deacon and also lay leadership. So I ask us to embrace the wisdom of the apostles and the fullness of the Orthodox Church. Reviving the diaconate, ordaining men and women called to this ministry so that we can proclaim the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in America. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for this really pragmatic perspective on the changing demographics, the changing realities of the church today, the priesthood, the laity, as well as a 
hopeful and also very pragmatic, very practical vision for how we might better minister to those needs. Thank you. Okay, we will now go on. Oh, there goes my timer, but I didn't even need it because you were under time. Thank you. Um, now we will go on to our next speaker, um, who will be Marilyn Ruvellis. Marilyn, there's been a little bit of change in order of people, so I hope you're, you're ready to swing with this. Um, she is a co-editor of the forthcoming book, Deaconesses, A Living Tradition for Today and Tomorrow, along with editors Petros Vesiliadis and Nikki Papa Yoryu and Father John Krasavgis, who himself is the author of the book about the diaconate, Remembering and Reclaiming Diaconia. Marilyn, we're so happy to have you here this evening and have your perspective. And I will start the timer and you go ahead and tell us your perspective on this question of need. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Can everyone hear me? Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I, well, first of all, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk about the, de uh, the women deacons, which I've cared about for a very long time, since about 1990. Okay, so what's that, 10, 30 years? Or I've been thinking about the issue. So, and the reason is because um, I was, uh, I'm a convert to orthodoxy. I was raised a Lutheran, um, and I married a Greek Orthodox back in 1967. So I was taken aback that women were not allowed behind the altar. That really struck me as strange. And I wasn't particularly comfortable with that. Um, my husband and I had a have a son and a daughter. And when our son became an altar boy, our daughter was hurt that she could not be included in the um, participate in the church in the way that her brother did. So fast forward about 35 years and our granddaughters who are now in college, who also resented when their brothers, our grandsons were serving at the altar and they couldn't. So I've, I've it's deja vu all over again. Um, and I am sorry to say that they really don't show an interest in being involved in the church or attending being members of the church. Um, so I think believe that ordained deaconesses would signal that the church officially recognizes that females are made in the image of God, that their gifts are welcomed, appreciated, and valued. And I believe that we're, the order was that Elizabeth was going to talk about that issue. So I will let her expand more on that and the importance of uh, the church needs to keep its women, it needs to keep parishioners and in in about how ordaining women deacons would help. So I'm gonna deviate a little bit and, and talk about one of the many questions of why women um, are not being ordained to the diaconate today. Um, one of the answers is the church needs courageous bishops. Um, the subject of my talk today um, is basically about uh, about courageous bishops, because only a bishop can ordain a, a deacon, a priest, and another bishop. Um, there are rare occasions in the modern world when a courageous bishop has stepped forward to do this. I mean, as we, as many of you probably know, it was a long tradition. There were ordained deaconesses up until about the 12th century. And that's a whole different historic discussion that we won't go into today. So the question is, why isn't it happening today? Um, so I'll give a couple of modern examples of a courageous bishops. So the first is in Greece in 1986, um, Metropolitan of Dimitriados ordained a nun, uh, Abbas Ephemia, uh, in the region of Volos. And now to my knowledge, uh, he the bishop was not punished for doing this. In fact, he went on to become Archbishop Christodoulos of Athens and worked with his synod of 64 bishops to obtain a vote in 2004 to restore the order of the diaconate for women. So that, I just would like you to, it's, it's almost breathtaking now when we think about how he was able to convince 64 bishops to agree to do this. Um, because uh, the, you'll, you'll see how we're having uh, difficulty uh, getting that, that part of the piece done. 
So unfortunately, uh, Archbishop, the Archbishop fell asleep four years later, and the new Archbishop of Greece and his Senate have, have not followed the same path. The second example is from just five years ago in 2017. A woman was ordained in the Armenian Orthodox Church in Iran. Um, in this case, she was not a nun, uh, but from the laity. And uh, that was the first in the Armenian Church, which has been ordaining women deacons for some time but it was always nuns that they were ordaining. But these, these kinds of actions of these courageous bishops did um, usually doesn't happen unless the bishop has the, the bishop senate gives its blessing to do that. Otherwise there could be very severe consequences for the lone wolf who tries to do this. <laughs> so in the book that I helped edit that is going to be coming out, um, Deaconess's Living Tradition for Today and Tomorrow. Um, there will be examples of courageous bishops who tried but encountered a great pushback, which can be informative for us. So a few examples of this. Um, in 1911, um, Metropolitan Nictarios, um, this is in Greece. He ordained two women deacons. Their names were Elizabeth and Magdalene, Magdalene for the convent of the Holy Trinity that he founded on the island of Aegina in Greece. However, in 1914, uh, in order to gain the final recognition of the convent, uh, Nectarios had to apologize for the ordinations and explain in writing that the women had been blessed as subdeaconesses, not deaconesses. So maybe I stop for a second to say, for those who may not know, um, a, a sub, the, the order of ordination is deacon, priest, and, and bishop. And those are done in the, in the middle of us, uh, among a, within, I'm sorry, within a, a sacrament, the sacrament of holy, of the, divine liturgy. So a blessing is done at a different time. So this uh, this was contrary to the, the his description that she was only a subdeaconess was contrary to Mary, Mother Magdalene's herself, her description of the ordination and that it was done at the divine liturgy. So you see that this ordination, which has been talked about very often uh, as an example of it can be done is still a point of contention and controversy. But uh, the very good news is that St. Nectarios was recognized as a saint in the Orthodox Church in 1961. So that is encouraging. Um, and then there is the uh, disheartening case of the Patriarch of Alexandria in all Africa ordaining I'll put in quotes, a woman deacon in 2017, but received such outcry from throughout some of the Orthodox world, Mount Athos uh, and others, uh, that he, like Metropolitan Nectarios, recanted in, 2000, in 2020 and recast the act as a blessing. Again, this is one of those situations mired in controversy. So um, I hope you can see the courage it takes for a bishop to ordain a woman and the challenge of getting a Senate to agree. So on the, on the Senate side, the Church of Russia um, was strongly considering ordaining women deacons. And this is, they had a very famous all Russian local council back in 1917 and 18. Um, and the, the issue went through numerous committees for an entire year. We, know, we don't know, of course, if it ever would have been approved because the process ended because of the Re Russian Revolution that started in 1917. Um, but today, I don't think the Russian church is considering it at all. Um, and then the other example of synods, a very famous one, is the in 2016, in preparation for the Holy and Great Council of the entire Orthodox Church, uh, the courageous Archbishop of Cyprus suggested that women deacons uh, be on the agenda. But this idea was promptly shut down and not considered. So as I was saying, the church needs these courageous bishops and it needs us to have the courage to speak to the bishops, uh, which is what I have tried. So, um, 
I'll just relate that I was at a conference with um, Metropolitan Calisto's Ware, um, and Anne Marie rightly pointed out a blessed memory. Um, he fell asleep uh, not long ago, and in fact, today was his funeral. And uh, we we're very fortunate that he often spoke publicly about women deacons, including he was on the board for St. Phoebe and at one point did a taped statement for one of their conferences. So in private one time, I brazenly asked him, would he ordain a woman deacon since he was for it? Uh, but immediately he said no, because his clerical status would be in jeopardy. His synod would have to approve such an act, and he didn't think that that was possible at that time. So this opened my eyes to the essential role a synod of bishops plays in our conciliar church. Uh, we don't have one head that can just say this is it, like the Pope. We are a conciliar church made up of synods. So all bishops belong to a synod that largely has to agree before any significant action can take place. So let me step back for a minute for a little broader perspective on the role of bishops, uh, on the role of bishops, priests, and deacons. In general, the bishop's role is that of providing unity. Um, the priest's role is sacramental, you know, conducting the uh, the sacraments, and the deacons is one of service of diakonia. That's the Greek word and where we get the word uh, de deacon. Diakonia means service. So we do need to understand that a bishop, uh, when we are talking with him, is juggling many issues and matters from religious to administrative to church politics while he tries to keep his diocese together, his role of unity. We need to appreciate this and carry on a dialogue on the ordination of women to the diaconate that includes listening to their needs while communicating ours. So with this in mind, um, on another occasion, I traveled all the way to um, Istanbul from the US uh, with a small group of people to talk with the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew in his office about the issue. Well, we got there, the office visit didn't happen, um, but we were invited to a meal at his home. And this was the next day. So after the meal, everyone was very relaxed, um, including his All Holiness, who was sitting in a low, soft chair. Um, and I knew that this was my only chance to bring up the subject after coming all this way. <laughs> so. I walked across the room and knelt down beside the chair to show him the photo of our daughter and granddaughters who were leaving the church and explained how ordaining women deacons would greatly encourage them to stay. Without hesitation, he responded that the conscience of the church wasn't ready. I didn't, I didn't know what that meant, but we didn't go into the discussion. Um, Later, I asked his archdeacon, what did that mean? And he said, the conscience of the church means that there is a widespread call to the bishops to ordain deaconesses from both the laity and the clergy. Bishops need to be hearing from the people about the need for the revival of the church. To prepare for those conversations, um, each of us should learn about the long history of deaconesses and the needs, that they the needs that they have met and can meet today. Um, in addition, begin a dialogue with your priest about his needs. I think Christina did a beautiful job with her incredible list of how, uh, how many demands are put on the priest, how much is expected of the priest. Um, it's incredible what he uh, does, what they do for us. And uh, she said, we can't always depend on volunteers. So um, dialogue with your priest about his needs and how he thinks a woman, a woman deacon might help. So have factual conversations and build trust, trusting relationships with your priest and bishop. Um, you don't have to begin by putting them on the spot like I did, kind of embarrassing to relate actually. So I wanted everyone to remember that St. Phoebe Center is actually the best resource for learning about Orthodox deaconesses. 
It is fulfilling an educational role with its conferences, websites, networking, and uh, webinars like these to help raise uh, the consciousness of the church. So thank you, thank St. Vivi Center for your outstanding work, especially tonight as we approach on Saturday, the feast day of the first woman deacon, St. Phoebe. May we all respond with our own gifts to her example of diaconia. Thank you, Marilyn, and amen to that final sentiment there. Thank you for your personal perspective, as well as these examples of the church needing courageous bishops, and I think also needing courageous laity and clergy too. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of the whole church moving together towards deaconesses with courage and a spirit of love is a great message for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We will turn now to our next panelist. Elizabeth Prodromo is senior researcher at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she directed the initiative on religion, law, and diplomacy, and taught on religion and geopolitics. She has worked with the Ecumenical Patriarchate on many projects, including serving as a special consultant to the Holy and Great Council in 2016, and as a member of the Ecumenical Patriarchate's Task Force on Modern Slavery. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to go ahead and start my timer and you take it over. Okay, I think I'm un unmuted. Am I unmuted? All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you, first of all, to everyone from St. Phoebe's, to, uh, to Carrie, Dr. Carrie Frederick Frost, and also to Anne Marie Massara and the entire St. Phoebe's board for organizing tonight's conversation and for the, invita the invitation to offer some reflections on this question of, is there a need for the revival of the ordained female diaconate? Um, I also want to thank my fellow panelists. It was really just an honor to be on the panel with you and to hear Christina and Marilyn, um, your insights and, and your recommendations. Uh, by way of thinking about the issue of need for reviving the ordained female diaconate, I have three basic points that I'd like to offer up for consideration as contribution to our discussion this evening. Um, the first point is a word on framing the issue. I want us to think about what are the implications of asking about the need as a kind of proof point for revival of the ordained female diaconate. Uh, in other words, does how we ask the question shape the possible outcomes? Um, the second point I want to consider is a word about timing, and more specifically, the ripeness and urgency of the current moment for reviving the ordained female diaconate. Um, is there something specific about the current moment? And both Christina and Marilyn, you've touched on these in, in, your, in, in your own ways, so I'll be amplifying, I think, some of the things you've said. And then finally, I would like to close on my third point with a word about what might be done concerning the who, the how, and the what actions. Um, so all of my comments come from you know, my own experience and certainly a place of love and respect for the church. Um, and uh, you know, my experience as an Orthodox Christian, as a mother and a, a wife, as an academic, as a practitioner, as a former diplomat, you know, all the things that have shaped my understanding of where I fit as a woman in the church and where women and girls fit in our church historically and today. And with regard to the issue of the uh, reinstatement of the female diaconate, um, I can say that traveling around the world and seeing you know, in the global church, the place, the plight, the talents, the gifts of women and girls, um, you know, really have uh, in, underscored to me the urgency of us um, addressing this question, I think, with precision and producing action of change because we do speak a lot about the issue and yet um, there hasn't been a whole lot of change. So um, let me go to the first point, which is how we frame the question. And I would say that how we frame this question does have implications for whether we actually make action and change. Um, the notion that it's necessary somehow to demonstrate need in order for action to be taken to reinstate the ordained female diaconate implies a kind of if-then logic. Uh, if there's need, then 
the diaconate will be reinstated. And I would suggest that this is problematic um, because it makes the reactivation of the, the office contingent upon some sort of arbitrary demonstration or proof of need. And I would ask then, who determines what qualifies as need? What's the threshold for need? Is it qualitative? Is it quantitative? Do decision, make, decision makers who define that measure or metric include men and women? Do they include hierarchs, clergy, and laity? Are they cross-generational? Um, so I would say that this kind of prove it to me approach uh, is a problematic way for us to ask the question because it contains in it the seeds of non-recognition of the historical experience of the living church. Um, because in fact, as we've heard tonight and as we've all read and we know, the foundation for the, the very office of the deaconess originates with the early church in the practices of the early church and in the life of a growing, um, expanding church. And so I would, I would submit that this notion that there needs to be proof of the need for the office of the deaconess fails to recognize that the, in the wisdom of the church itself, um, that, was, that, answer, that question has been long answered, not only for centuries, but for millennia. Um, so for the kind of respect for the living faith and a living church and living tradition that you know the late uh, Metropolitan Cardistus Ware spoke so eminently ab about, I think we've already answered the question about whether or not there's need. And I would submit that the need really is about responsibility. What we're talking about when we discuss the reinstatement or the reactivation of the deaconess is the responsibility of the church today and decision makers. And I think as Marilyn, you so eloquently pointed out, you know, in particular bishops, but um, males who dominate the decision-making structure of orthodoxy, local and global, um, for them to act responsibly and consistent with what the church has called for, which is the office of an ordained female diaconate. So I think we shouldn't um, fall into the trap of asking the question about, is there need? That, that's already been decided. And I think as Christina beautifully pointed out, that whereas the origins of the diaconate, the female diaconate came with a growing, expanding church, today, the female diaconate can also respond to, in many cases, and certainly in the US, but in other parts of the world, a contracting church. So the, the service of the diaconate, the female diaconate, the female deaconess will serve by helping to grow and regrow the church and address some of the, the causes possibly for the contraction in the church. Um, and I would close this first point by saying um, that the reason that we hear so commonly this question of is there a need for reinstatement is really part of the hegemonic framing of um, the, the issue where the failure to meet the failure to meet the responsibility of the church to reinstate the uh, office of the female diaconate comes from at best institutional complacency um, lack of courage and at worst lack of concern and also from the deliberate dissembling and misrepresentation of the issue by those who claim that reinstitution of the deaconess is none, nothing more than a smoke, a smoke screen, an artifice for an agenda for the ordination of women to the priesthood. These are separate, if related issues, but they are separate issues. And it's incumbent upon all who fail to decouple these issues to realize that they're making a deliberate choice that cripples the church's fullness because it forecloses a more healthy, full, honest, and complicated conversation about the responsibility to reinstate the office of the female diaconate. One last footnote on this first point about why else the question is framed in a way that I've suggested is not helpful. I think that's also because of something that you, you pointed out, Marilyn, so, so importantly, and that's female lack of unity and lack of agency 
and lack of confidence in speaking about this issue and, and the, uh, the willingness of women of all generations to speak and give voice to this issue. So I'll, I'll conclude on the first point. The second point, um, a word on the timing and on the ripeness and the urgency of the current moment. I think, you know, again, as Christina beautifully pointed out um, with her references to uh, measurements about the you know, contraction in the numbers of Orthodox in America, uh, that's a more generalizable trend. But I'd, I'd like to say that, you know, the current moment shows us that, you know, data from a whole range of authoritative sources, whether, you know, the World Bank, whether the United Nations, you know, from their sustainable development goals, that data shows that they, women and girls worldwide, are disproportionately affected by pandemics and other public health crises, by climate change, by forced migration due to war and climate emergencies, by all forms of sexual exploitation and physical and psychological violence, and by economic marginalization and poverty. These are ills that aff afflict the whole planet, but they disproportionately affect women and girls. And this is as, as true in the United States as it is in other parts of the develop, developed and developing world. We also know that data from a host of sources, again, one mentioned by Christina, but we can also see in the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, the General Social Survey, that since the 1990s, there's been a remarkable increase in the religiously unaffiliated, the so-called nuns in the United States and with a general and precipitous decline in Christianity in the United States. Now, exceptions were found in the global South, but we see this growing number of religiously unaffiliated. And that's disproportionately in the Christian communities, communions affecting Orthodox. Um, so the, the reinstatement of uh, the female diaconate would help not only again in terms of sustainability, understood in terms of growth, but importantly in terms of regrowth and in supporting priests in particular with the pastoral and the liturgical needs, the very complex intersecting needs that for women and girls that come out of the phenomena that I, you know, I mentioned at the outset of this point. So, you know, ministering to all the needs that arise from climate disruption and economic uh, marginalization and impoverishment, the need, for example, for livelihoods training, for women heads of households around the world, but especially in war-torn countries. Think about a place like Syria, that since the war in Syria in 2011, 60%, that's a rough estimate, it may be higher, but we know that at least 60% of heads of households in Syria are now female heads of households. Men have either left or died. And those women need literacy training, they need livelihoods training. Female deaconesses could assist with clergy and also with non-governmental organizations in providing that kind of livelihoods training, especially in providing the kind of psychological and psychosocial trauma care um, that so many women in conditions of war have, uh, have urgent need for. Um, so there is something particular about the current moment regarding both the growth of the church the church's service to the world, but also responding to the contraction of the church and the regrowth of the church. Um, I'll turn now just to the third point very briefly. And Carrie, how am I doing on time? Do I have like two A minutes? A couple more minutes, yeah. Okay, okay, great. And I'll, 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 meet the, I'll meet the clock. Um, in terms of some suggest suggestions for what could be done in order to recover what I would say is our authentic ecclesiology, um, and how the exclusion of women from the diaconate is part of a more general marginalization and diminution, a, a, a limiting of women and a, a reduction in the value of women in the life of the church. So I would make the following concrete uh, suggestions for our consideration. First and foremost, as Marilyn pointed out, I think there's a need for courage and that's courage by decision makers um, that are primarily the hierarchy, but courage from the clergy and also from the laity and courage from women. And that means the courage to give voice. Uh, the courage of vocality is not a small thing, especially in a church that historically has taught that oftentimes voice is equivalent to disruption. But if we think about the ecumenical councils, if those weren't disruptors, what were they? 
And those are the things that we look to for the greatness of and the teachings of our church. So learning to give voice and give courage at every level. I would say with regard to the issue of, you know, consequences, I would, again, frame things slightly different, differently. The consequences that many hierarchs say that they fear, um, you know, for perhaps taking the step to call for the reinstatement or even reinstating female deaconesses outside of the context of a synodal decision. I think that they should think about the, the, um, the severity of consequences for not fulfilling the responsibility to reinstate the office of the deaconess. So again, it's how we frame the question and how we think about it. So one is courage. Let's all get some courage and let's get some agency and some vocality. The second um, is the need for cross-generational and I would say local and international activism. Uh, because around the world, Orthodox women, young, middle-aged, old, however we you know, place ourselves on that timeline, um, share uh, a, a, a hope for and a need for uh, the reinstitution of the diaconess. And we have to think about ways to work locally and globally and cross-jurisdictionally and internationally about this. The third point um, I would suggest is look at what's available. There's a, there are available options. At, the, uh, at Holy Cross, Helena College Holy Cross, there's the program for deacons. Introduce deaconesses to the program for deacons. There's no reason not to do it. Again, it's, it's an issue of will. That's, that's my humble perspective. The fourth point I would make is um, go gradual. Introduce female altar servers. Um, I think if there's any way that we can see and begin to apprehend how ready the conscience of the church is at every level, it would be at the local level to see how people respond to female altar servers. So female altar service, and I would remind those who say that that's a radical step by, by saying that no one can be in that altar without a purpose. And your eminence, Metropolitan Seraphim, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I believe that it's indeed the case that no one, male or female, can be in the altar space without a particular purpose. So female altar servers. The next uh, point I would suggest is um, to stop conflating the question of reinstituting the female diaconate with the question of female ordination to the priesthood. Um, this is, you know, uh, I would say it's a, it's a false um, equivalent. We need to decouple these questions and address them on their own merits. It's not that they're unrelated, but they are indeed separate. And as long as they are coupled together, my, uh, my sense from you know, reading and from participating in discussions and experientially is that there will be neither of those two things. So um, I would ask us to go back to Webster's Dictionary and look up um, you know, the various definitions of the term need. And along all of those definitions, um, there is a need today to reinstate the, the female diaconate, the ordained female diaconate. But most importantly, is one of the definitions, which is responsibility. And again, looking to the life of our church and to what the church has decided, and that we say as Orthodox, we practice, um, the establishment of the female diaconate goes back millennia. And so we need to recover and reinvigor reinvigorate um, that office. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for such provocative and eloquent remarks, particularly on this idea of refocusing the conversation to think about the wisdom of the church, to think about the history of the church, and to respect that wisdom and history and act, as you said, with responsibility and courage. Thank you so much. So now we will I'm going to pose a couple of questions to our panelists. Thank you all of you together. Um, and then we'll open in a few minutes to general questions. So panelists, some say that if the Orthodox Church were to encourage and promote lay ministry of women and men, that this would address any perceived need for deaconesses and the church today. I think most of us, if not all of us, would agree that more lay involvement, lay ministry in the church is a good thing. But does elevating lay ministry address the needs that we are discussing here this evening? How does the setting aside of women as ordained deaconesses 
address the church's needs in ways that maybe lay ministry does not. Who would like to go first? Christina, you're already unmuted, so. <laughs> um, well, I think as I was saying, the, the issue for me is two reasons. One is, again, how is that going to be consistent? What does, what does elevate lay ministry mean? Um, so, yeah, what does, how do you define that? What does elevating it mean? And also that there's people who are called, this is their vocation, they want to serve in this way. And there's people who want to volunteer for a little while when they have time or to help the church out, but don't want that to be their vocation and ministry. So I think there's this need for two separate distinct things. So not everybody that volunteers in the church becomes a priest. Not everybody that uh, becomes a priest was also a church school teacher or choir director. So I think to me, it's, it's two separate, two separate ministries. Thank you. Thanks for that perspective. Marilyn, would you be willing to offer some thoughts? Um, I think actually uh, Christina said something that really struck me during her remarks in that she said the guidance of the Holy Spirit that comes with the ordination. If you read the ordination prayers that are, that are said over when they're ordained, you are bringing, it's a sacrament. So you are it's like in the specialness of a baptism or a specialness of a marriage, you are bringing the Holy Spirit to be with that person in a special way. And so I think that is important to, we as a church recognize that we respect and need ordained people that are guided by the Holy Spirit. And so I think that uh, that is an important uh, attribute. Also, I think the, Christina also said that you you would then be a, a person that is accountable to the church. I mean, accountable, to, uh, you were part of the church structure. And I think that you will get more respect from the high, other hierarchs and the, the clergy if you have that, uh, have that special, uh, that special ordination. So that's just one reason that that I would think that it would be important. So Elizabeth, what? Well, I would agree with everything that you and Christina have both said. And I would just add one last thing. I think, again, it's about how we ask the question, because how we ask the question creates a set of possibilities for potential answers and outcomes. And I would say that, you know, this idea of you know, lay ministry, let's do lay ministry, and that's fine. Uh, that's an either or, either or way of asking the question. Why not both and lay ministry and um, reinstatement of uh, the ordained female diaconate? It, it needn't be either or. And lay ministry should not be a substitute. It should be, um, you know, an addition. Um, mm -hmm. There's plenty of space in the church and in terms of what uh, the church can do for Orthodox Christians for the, and for this world to include both the elevation of the female lay ministry as well as the reinstatement of the ordained diaconate. So I think it's about asking that question. It should be both and rather than either or. Wonderful responses cumulatively together. Really great perspective. Thank you, panelists. So tonight among us, we have a guest, His Eminence Metropolitan Seraphim of Zimbabwe and Angola. Welcome to you, Your Eminence. And if you're willing, we would love to hear your perspective on this question of need for deaconesses in the situation of Africa in particular. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a blessing and honor for me, especially in May, Professor Elizabeth. I arranged with some other partners in uh, universities in Athens to organize a special seminar uh, to approach some crucial problems like the climate change or the interfaith dialogue, 
the invasion of the Russians in Ukraine and some other things. But the most amazing is that uh, the partners in Greece, uh, they invited uh, the speakers were all, all of the men. And the professor Elizabeth, she arranged all the speakers who came from the States to be women. <laughs> Even the, it was supposed the ambassador of the United States to come to meet us. But the uh, the ambassador who came was also a lady. Anyway, um, uh, we're talking about different um, uh, situations, the things um, uh, are different in the, as you know, in the first century and are different in the 21st century. There are 20 centuries difference. So uh, nobody can reject the reality that the role of women in the community is always was important, uh, but now more. So uh, Professor Elizabeth, she spoke about responsibility. See, so this is the criteria for anything we can trust. If somebody is not responsible, <laughs> we cannot trust <laughs> to do anything. <laughs> and even when we have problems in the marriage for the kids, uh, we, we uh, the parents are worried about their children, uh, not about them, about their, their kids, <laughs> if they're not responsible. So responsibility is coming to all the levels and how it's coming. It's coming because you are qualified to do something because you go to study many universities or it's depend also of your relation with God. And when we say relation with God, um, how, what is your idea? you have about God? What do you understand by God? Uh, Saint Athanasius, the great, in the fourth century, who introduced this term of the Nicene Greek, homoousios. Um, he used a simple example. He asked the people to close their eyes and then he asked them, and what is the definition of the darkness? Is, uh, if we close our eyes, simple example, it's not the absence of the, of the light. So darkness is not there. So people who live without this uh, relation with God to accept that God is there, is like as they are walking in their lives with their eyes, with this darkness and anything is happening. So I come now about uh, what's going in Alexandria. Um, there are many ways to upgrade the role of women in the church. And you know, today the majority of the people who help and they are involved in the ministry of the church are women. If we go to get some statistics, for example, about the Sunday school teachers, we are going to see that the majority are women. And then if you see who is involved also in the ministry, which is very important in the ministry of Christ to offer to the people, not to wait them to come to the church, to go to look after them, to be with them. Today I was in one, uh, seminar, I am here in the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches, and we ask a group of people to visit, uh, I think uh, Elizabeth, she called them manager, the people who are in the corner, neglected, poor. She, so there was a group who visited India. And when they were in one remote place, when they arrived in our village, they met there some women who were sitting on the floor. And, two, three of them, they went out to find chairs to break from them. And the ladies who visited them, they told them, no, we don't want to sit on chairs. If there are no chairs for everybody here, we cannot go to use the chairs for us. So even to go to see somebody, to meet, to be with him. And so these are the women. So uh, St. Paul was very clever because he was the apostle of the nations and he has to go everywhere. So he experienced also the sufferings and the problems of the people. And so he realized that he has to invite with him also uh, women to help him in this ministry because we don't have so many other evidence. Uh, St. Paul is the one who uh, invited uh, women to be followed. And yesterday in the reading, there was a reference about the dialogue of Christ and the Samaritan. Samaritan was, uh, first of all, all the Samaritans were rejected. 
but m much more the the women <laughs> and how Christ he came in dialogue with her. So uh, we have to understand that even I remember my great grandmother in Cyprus before uh, you know in the village they have to prepare the bread for, for the Holy Eucharist. And so uh, she she asked me to wash my hands in order to prepare the small, the first part of prosimi, in order to prepare the bread and then to give it to the priest to do the Holy Eucharist. So in a very symbolic way, the only person who uh, represented the humanity is the mother of God when she received this invitation by God, let's be with your will. In the same way we say every day the hour prayer, um, let your kingdom come, let's be your will, our Father, from this. Huh? So the, the kingdom of God is with us when we follow the will of God and I put aside my own will and what is the will of God, our salvation. So in this perspective, there was always very care um, uh, in the uh, very care about how to look after people in the church. But you see, uh, we have to take it to account also what happened, why the institution of the deaconess disappeared slowly, slowly. In the beginning, when Christ and the apostles went around, they didn't meet uh, Christians or Orthodox. The people were not Christians. They believed in different uh, religious, some of them, they, uh, and so there were most of them old people. They are not, to, and after slowly, slowly, we consider that is very important in order to protect our kids, to baptize them at the age when they are babies. So you see how the deaconess were also to help the adults and the ladies. So, uh, of course, I agree, we have to be responsible, but also sometimes there is pastoral, pastoral in order to improve our pastoral ministry. We need, so today we also in Africa, we realize that we have to prepare adults, people who believe in the rivers, natural religion, um, and they want to be Christians. We have to prepare for catechesis. But it's not a matter only that we need them in catechesis. Let's come to the second, to the primary education, secondary education, university. Me, I have everywhere ladies. My best professor was a lady. Uh, my best the theologian in the secondary school, uh, in the primary school, everywhere. And I remember in Greece um, when there were some funds from the European Union, but there was a condition in order to get these funds, the school to be open for boys and for girls. Uh, there were only schools uh, for boys who were candidate to be later clergymen or to join the church choir. And there was a lot of debate. And then because there were elections, the minister was very clever. And he said, no problem, we're going to get the funds, but you know, there is one rule in order to get one student, we need the letter of the bishop, a recommendation. So see how they behave. And I remember I, I wrote a small article and I said, okay, we have 50 schools, church schools. If we have only one also for girls, what is the problem since we have the women everywhere in all the levels, but uh, I don't like to speak too much. So there was a resolution in our synod to introduce the institution of the ordination of women as deaconess. And then we found the most amazing when we went back to the manuscripts of the text of the service of the ordination, it was exactly the same. Uh, you know, it's like in English, in Greek, uh, there was only this difference, he, she, there was only this change, but the text was exactly the same. Uh, now, as I am here in the General Assembly of the WCC, in following this resolution of the unanimous resolution of our synod, 
uh, we try to ungrade the position of women. There are, there are many obstacles. For example, I remember 25 years ago when I was in Nairobi, one young girl who was involved in a Sunday school teacher, we find some friends uh, through the OCMC in the United States to give him a scholarship to come to study in the Holy Cross. And, and you know, after 25 years, what is the situation now in Kenya? We have only one lady theologian. <laughs> is this lady? <laughs> I mean, uh, we fail to give more opportunities. For me, we are on about uh, 200 ladies who are ready to be deaconess in Africa to help us. So we're waiting any time to do this. But at the same time, we can upgrade uh, their involvement in the ministry of the church in many ways. There is one lady now, uh, Isabel Papadia from uh, Kisasa. Uh, she is responsible for uh, issues of women, gender. Uh, she is uh, responsible in the National Council of Churches of Congo in Kisasa. Her husband is a local priest also, and he's a, a professor in the university. So now we try to organize a network with other countries, other dioceses. And this, uh, the only theologian we have in Kenya, she is responsible not how to organize the network for the uh, involvement of women in teaching, uh, of the Orthodox teaching among the people to the women, to the youth. And, and then we have another one lady who will try to give her um, a training from Harare, how to organize the network or to get the sustainable development goals. Although all of us were very disappointed because in eight years uh, is the year for the implementation of policies to get the sustainable development goals to end poverty. But uh, it's very difficult. You see, you know, uh, we waste resources. Uh, no, we didn't waste. Oh, during the pandemic, I mean, we spent a lot of money. And now, unfortunately, we have the invasion of the Russians in Ukraine every day. We waste a lot of resources on missiles. And I was uh, myself three weeks in, uh, ago in Liberia, and the kids there, they don't have water, they don't have uh, uh, food. Uh, it's a disaster. Uh, before to start the General Assembly here, uh, we will try to organize a pre-assembly for women. Uh, I'm going to get the report and to send to you to share it. So please pray how to find ways and the Holy Spirit to lead us in this direction. Because even when St. Peter was very conservative, uh, who, what is going to happen? Somebody who is isn't Jewish, uh, is not Jewish, to be first Jewish and then to be Christian. And then he received this oracle from God for the Holy Spirit to go to baptize Cornelius, who was a Roman. And then when they arranged the meeting of the Apostolic Synod, he was sure what to say. So let's pray the Holy Spirit to lead us to this direction, because really we need, and very soon, to have many deaconess to improve our ministry in the church. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. I could listen to you all day talk about your experiences, and it's especially helpful to have the theological perspective that you gave just now, and also this pastoral perspective, because these things are, of course, connected. Um, so we really appreciate you being here with us. I know it's the middle of the night for you, especially. Thank you so much for being with us. So you got my, my important message that as the mother of God gave her own body for our salvation, in the same way the, my grandmother, when she prepared the prosphoro in a symbolic way, and then the priest asked her servant, he offered this on behalf of all of us to be the body of Christ. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Really beautiful. So now we will stop our recording. It's hard to see everything. There's the hand, Teva. Okay. Well, it's great to be here and thank you very much for this um, wonderful, wonderful ministry. And 
And I agree with um, Phyllis, the Roman Catholics have a very, very active um, uh, organization that is really international. And I think that it would be behold um, St. Phoebe to partner with them. And, and the more the merrier, uh, more voices, the more that are heard. Let us pray. God, our creator of all that we know and all that we shall come to know, we thank you for this time to discern your will for us and for your church. As the women were given the commandment to proclaim the resurrection of Christ and to enter through the door of fear and proclaim your gift of new life. So grant us the courage to break down the doors of fear that the chains of intolerance has held many captive. As you sent your Holy Spirit to bring unity among your people and open the eyes of the blind, allow the deaf to hear and your truth to be proclaimed, send us to live and teach your truth. Allow us to discern the ministry that you call us to, given to us when we were called in our mother's womb and given the gift of the Holy Spirit in the sacrament of chrismation. May we continue to work for all those who have become witnesses to us, especially those who left homes to come to North America to plant the cross in this land and to discover the understanding of true subornos. We live the commandment to love one another and to teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless everybody. Thank you, Father Peter. What an exceptionally beautiful prayer to end such an exceptionally wonderful evening. Thank you everyone for being here. Please stay in touch and God bless. Good night. Thank you.